Welcome in to the PFF Podcast. Steve Palazzolo back here with Sam Monson. Sam, how you doing? It's mailbag time. Ready to go? Love the mailbag. That's it? Yeah, that's all I got. Sure love love the mailbag. Sometimes we like to uh, have a little bit of banter back and forth, Sam. Can we insert some banter? Insert Just banter? Off? Love the mailbag. Yeah. Insert banter here. I Carry like on. the mailbag as well. Uh... That's all I got. Let's just get into it. We've got some pictures and diagrams for this first one, Sam. It's all about onside kicks. And most of the time, if you ask us about special teams, we will delete that immediately. But we did decide to answer this one. I don't know. We've, answered, is... we've answered a lot of special teams questions in our mailbag. We seem to have actually a disproportionate amount of special teams fixing questions now that I think of it. Maybe these are all just Gordon... In his uh, burner accounts, well, that's possible. Us. Luke from St. Paul, otherwise known as Gordon. Otherwise, yeah. This from now on, every special teams question we will assume came from Gordon. Okay, Luke, we're on to your game out in St. Paul. But we essentially, add, he asked, uh, we need to add Minnesota. By the way, now that we have St. Paul to our uh, cross it off our map. There you go, Taylor. Add there. Minnesota. Taylor's done it. Add we're Minnesota. good. We're good. We're getting everywhere. That's basically like uh, another Canadian province. Anyway. Uh, we are looking at onside kicks and how they're rarely successful. I'm, I'm not going to read the whole email. There's many paragraphs. Um, <laughs> many but he paragraphs. does cite the New England Patriots and their terrible onside kick attempts against the Miami Dolphins on Monday Night Football a couple weeks ago. And Sam, he essentially says, you know, it, it's a low success rate. There are some ugly kicks out there. Why not just kick a ball as hard as you can right at the defense? Yes. And have the ball bounce off of them as long. It doesn't even have to go ten yards in theory. Just bounce it off of them. Maybe it bounces back to the team, and then you can recover it. Why is this not an implemented strategy in football? Well, yeah. The interesting thing about this is that you thought it was a good idea. I, I'll reveal my thoughts when it's time. I think it's a pretty good idea. I think it's a good. Uh, it's. I think it's a good change of pace. I'm not saying do it every time. I'm. <laughs> I think you're underestimating exactly how hard it is to hit a stationary human being ten yards away from the ball you're trying to drill at his face. Yeah, but the the, the point is here. I, I wish I had onside kick success rate handy, but it's what ten percent maybe. Yes. So it's so you have a ten percent chance. Yes. I mean, it's not like trying to kick a ball ten yards away as hard as you can, or like skip it off his knee or something like that, and then recovering. It's not like that is that much more difficult than the current way of trying to recover onside kicks, which is trickeration or the proper bounce or luck or whatever it is. I think it probably is. I think teams are pretty good now at at least getting the right type of kick that gives you the chance of recovering it if all goes well. Now, where the percentage comes is that just getting from that point is the easy part. Like having everything else go right in order for you to actually recover the thing is where you get into more trouble. Like you are, I think, reducing the percentage of the, the difficult or the easy thing being successful and still having the problem of actually recovering it once that happens. Uh, look, I, I look at it as potentially just a tool in the toolbox, right? Everybody's got multiple onside kick, uh, you know, attempts and formations and, You've got the the high bounce one. You got the little pooch. You got the fake one way. Let's kick it the other. You got the little let's kick it and just have the kicker run with it. You know until until ten yards. It's all about alignment and where guys are. I think it's just it's a tool in the toolbox. That's all it is. So you see this as like a like a golf bag. You know you've got a, a bunch of yes. different clubs in there that you can break out for your whatever takes your fancy that week in terms of onside kick. Well, schematically, whatever works schematically. I, studying the other team. I think you probably just try and master one form of onside kick because they're that hard. I don't. But then people know what you're bringing at them. They have know, you, you know. Have you not seen those videos where people line up and they try and like belt a soccer ball at somebody against a wall as hard as humanly possible? And most of the time, it comes back and either ricochets into their face or they just miss the guy entirely. It's pretty hard to hit hit a hit a human being from ten yards away with a ball. Is all I'm saying. Yeah, well, it's here's the deal. The premise of the question was it can't be any worse than New England's onside kick attempt on Monday Night Football. Well, no, and that was pitiful. Based off of that premise, I, I agree. It would have been at least a better yeah. option. So, Based on that being your other option, it's definitely better. But that All probably right. shouldn't have ever been an option for anybody. 
All right, we've we've exhausted that one enough. Uh, enough onside kick stuff. Just uh, win the game without having to uh, resort to an onside kick would be my suggestion. Anyway, we've got uh, St- Sam and Steve, big fan of the podcast. You're two great hosts. Originally, Sam was the clear-cut favorite, but since Steve has cut the baseball references out of his podcasting game, he's now a narrow second. I don't like where this is going. That, when did that, that happen, did... by the way, that you cut them out? I must have missed that. Well, so now, in recent weeks, because you've threatened me, I, I, <laughs> I merely tease them. I say, well, I have a story, but I can't tell it. You know, maybe maybe I'll put it on like an Instagram story or something off the air where it doesn't piss you off as much. You that know? would be great if you could do that. If, I'm sure. Well, everybody would love it. I'm they're sure. Husband. They're just, they just they're relatable, you know? Yeah. And uh, just so you know, I played professionally. So, you know, it's just a reminder that I was once an athlete. Uh, of. So there's, there's a lot to this question as well. I don't want to get into the specifics, but the basic gist of it is uh, this is, uh, who wrote this here? This is Chase. Is it Chase? Uh, it's from uh, Chase from Georgia. So we could throw Georgia on the map, he said. Well, he's also, adding, also he's given us a bunch of states, so he doesn't specify the other states we can add to his tally. Just another uh, well, several states, south, several states the in the south. Right. He views the south the same way I do. He just says several states in the south. Just you know, I'm in that big circle that you guys have that you guys have gotten emails from. Okay, so just um, another tally for the south as a whole. I right. see. I see. So his question or his suggestion is that the Browns hire Peyton Manning, and he does say. The Browns just go YOLO and sign Peyton Manning as their head coach starting next season. And it's because he's a great football mind and he knows how to read defenses and he can mentor quarterbacks and all these different things that he's listing. What are your thoughts on this, Sam? Do you think this would be a good move to hire Peyton Manning as a head coach? Well, I guess the initial thing is I don't know if Peyton Manning has any interest in being a coach of any description. It sounds like he's more into ownership or GMing a team rather than taking the nitty gritty of the head coaching part. I think he's got ideas above that at this point. So I think that's your first stumbling block. Um, As for how he'd actually do if he was a head coach, it's an interesting question because a lot of the best head coaches aren't really the kind of the nitty gritty play calling types. They're the ones that can just oversee everything and make it all come together. Peyton Manning, it feels like if he has an advantage in, in any area, it would be, specifically knowing how to play call and how to scheme an offense and that kind of stuff. Um, so he would be a very much hands-on one. And then you've got how well is, how good is he at essentially conveying an offense to every, to somebody else and to somebody that's else. That's my biggest question, Sam. That's, that's why I don't think he'd necessarily be good. And to you somebody else that isn't as good at it as op- at operating it as he was, which would be a big thing. Right. Like he was great because he would get to the line of scrimmage and he didn't even like run a complicated offense. He just had an answer to everything. Right. He could just look at the defense and say, I know when you give me this look, you're playing this coverage 48 percent of the time and I'm going to run the play that beats that coverage. And here we go. And I don't know how easy it is to to teach that. And and then it's all about his recall. Right. Like everybody's talked about what he can recall. And it's, you know, 12 years ago, he remembers this one exotic blitz that a team ran at him you it's tough to teach you can't teach you know what's in your computer brain it's his it's his recall and his ability to make instant decisions on the fly i i mean there's this there's a section of great athletes that make horrendous coaches because they can't understand why the people they're coaching can't just be better right Um, and it's happened across like that's why michael jordan was a terrible basketball coach Roy Keane Wayne Gretzky too right I think for in hockey like the two greatest in their sport to to you on that one but Wayne Gretzky if you say um, I'm sure Steve's right he's never led me astray before that's hockey Sam I know I know that I just don't know enough about him to talk about it Um, Roy Keane soccer same deal Uh, ah yeah great great player terrible coach because his thing is you get there you're telling them what to do it's simple I could do it easily how come you guys can't just be better at this and they just Ted get Williams frustrated. In baseball, Sam. Yeah, Ted Williams in baseball wasn't a good hitting coach, but the greatest hitter of all time. Well, there you go. Um, and Jordan, you know, came back was like, basically, if you guys don't stop being or don't start being better at this, I'm just going to come back and do it myself. And he did, and he was better than them at like forty odd years old or whatever he was. <laughs> so That's ridiculous. I, I kind. It's a slightly different dynamic, I think, because Manning's greatness was so very cerebral. But I think you might end up in exactly the same situation because you just. He would never understand why other people can't process that. Yeah, uh, look, that's my answer. That's essentially my answer. You know, 
Well, there you go. <laughs> Bill Belichick's a great coach, and it wasn't necessarily because he was the best player. It's just not this direct correlation between greatness as a player and greatness as a coach, or even as uh, a front office personnel person. You know, yeah. it's 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 a completely different dynamic. You're just doing different things. So he probably wouldn't be very good at it, and he doesn't want to do it. Other than that, it's a perfect plan. All right, perfect. Uh, let's move on. We've got. Uh, question from travis it's pretty simple why does jamie collins suck now that is the browns linebacker former new england patriot uh grades have uh essentially fallen off the table the last couple years uh new england traded him last year cleveland used him more as a as an edge rusher rather than a traditional linebacker but we're talking about a guy who in 2014 88.8 grade 2015 89.2 grade those grades all a part of pff edge of course uh, and then last year drops to 47.6 with a bit of a position change, more of a more of an edge rusher. But this year, back to a traditional linebacker role and a 35.9, that is 86th among 91 qualifying linebackers. Do you have anything here, Sam? Or uh, Yeah, well, our, uh, our esteemed colleague and longtime Brown sufferer, um, John Costco, pulled out some numbers about Collins and his his blitz percentage stuff essentially his the data on his pass rushing and his blitz stuff um, and the browns are definitely using him in a different way that the patriots did even in terms of a pass rusher they're using him as we said or as you said as more of a, an edge rusher as opposed to a guy that be, that become forms part of the pass rush as a blitzer up the a gap or the b gap inside more um, and it turns out looking from those numbers that he's never been great as an edge rushing threat all of his or his best production has come f in the middle as more of a, a blitzer um, again in those fashions. So th I think the Browns in that area are using him differently and in an area that he's never been particularly good at. What I don't have a good answer for is why he can't cover anybody anymore. Yeah, so it's got to be something more. I, I, well, I think a big part of it is a little bit more schematic. I think he's a bit – I think he's generally a better – zone coverage player but when he played zone in new england they didn't play a ton of zone with him in new england he actually played a lot more man but when he did play zone he did have a knack for turnovers and uh they would you know, they would play him in the middle of tampa too where he'd run the seam and use his athleticism and he picked off andrew luck in the playoffs i believe it was on uh you know one of those plays and he just had this knack for finding the ball he hasn't necessarily played that uh middle linebacker position though for Cleveland, he's playing a little bit more on the outside, and this was the issue that got him. This is one of the things that got him in trouble in New England. While he flashed those skills in zone, he did start freelancing a bit more, not working within the scheme. And there were times this year where you could see he's just not getting deep enough. He's not recognizing concepts in, uh, as much. So um, I don't have a clean answer, but I could tell you what is going wrong. And he, so he's not playing zone as smoothly as. Uh, he was when he when he had the opportunity in New England. Um, and then when when the Patriots used him in man coverage, overall, he was a solid man guy. He would he'd get lost against a running back down the field every now and again. But, um, yeah, I just I just think there's a little bit of not playing to his strengths. And it, I think there's just a lot of coaching at play, too. You you're coming from a system where New England is known for putting guys in the best position to succeed. And you're going to Cleveland where, you know, guys are. They're not winning any games, Sam, so maybe the coaching just isn't as good as it is in New England. That's uh, that's all I'll say on that one. Yeah. There was some good stuff. There was some good stuff by John uh, Costco, though, that he pulled out. Uh, when uh, when Collins was in New England, he blitzed through the A-gap 35% of the time. And here in Cleveland, so 35%, he's only in, in the A-gap, so that's right over the center. And what he would do often in New England, be right over the center, and he would essentially get isolated – on a running back quite a bit and uses athleticism. He could beat a running back. I mean, he was an actual edge rusher in college and had 10 sacks his last year. So he could beat running backs one-on-one -on -one, and he's only done that half as much in Cleveland, the a gap blitz only a 20.8% of the time. Um, so it's little things like that, where even that grade that he got in new England, those good grades, a lot of it was him as a pass rusher or as a blitzer, right? He's get, you know, getting that, uh, either an unlo unblocked pressure or an isolated isolation on a running back where he could do a good job. Yep. I think that makes some sense. I think that's sufficient. Yep. Covered it. Still a good athlete and uh, has a chance to turn things around. All right. We have a question from a PFF analyst. Mr. Kevin Ringrose asks us, 
what does Earl Thomas do so well in Seattle? That we've mentioned this over and over on the podcast, Sam. You've said Earl Thomas plays free safety and he does, you know, he allows Seattle to do different things schematically and he's so special and it, we've referenced it quite a bit, but I don't know if we've actually gone into some of the nuts and bolts of exactly what it is that Earl Thomas does that allows Seattle some creativity on the defensive end. So do you want to get into that just a little bit? Yeah, apparently we've talked about it so much and never actually explained why it happens um, or what he allows you to do. The, Earl Thomas, the big things he has are incredible quickness and range. You know, the, the ability to get from one side of the field to the other and cover more ground than basically anybody else. So you can put him in free safety and he influences areas of the field that other free safeties can't. And essentially what that does is reduce the amount of ground that other people have to cover. Because if you think of cover three, um, the idea is those three deep zones, the free safety in the middle and the two cornerbacks, split the field into thirds, essentially. Uh, but with Earl Thomas, that middle third becomes bigger, and, and those two guys at a cornerback don't have to cover as much ground because they know Thomas will make sideline to sideline. And the same kind of thing is true in terms of cover one, where you just have one safety over the top and everybody else is in man coverage. You know that Thomas can make more ground up than other safeties out there. So if you know that's true, what you can do is you can start to cheat a little bit. So you can lock Richard Sherman up one-on-one, -on -one, and you can have Earl Thomas cheat to the other side and help the other corner out knowing that, that uh, Sherman is going to be fine. So they can still line up with this single high look, but essentially you're only playing one side of the field with that safety and still be able to impact those plays. Yeah, so when you, when you draw up cover three on the chalkboard and you're just like, all right, this is your basic cover three, you, you stick the free safety directly in the middle of the field, right? Yeah. So when, what you're saying about Thomas, when he leans one way, their common way of playing cover three is Cam Chancellor, the guy who uh, on the chalkboard, again, is supposed to be in the box. He can actually almost start from more of a free safety position and creep down into the box. So actually what you're getting is almost in the way they played. It's almost like he's an extra deep defender if he reads pass quickly enough. And so now it's cover three, but you've really got four deep defenders and you've got a little bit more flexibility with what Cam Chancellor can do as well. But then if it's a run, he could just jump up, play his run responsibility, and it's just it's your normal cover three and you're fine. So um, I think that's all it is, man. It's just it's changing spacing. It's changing uh, help and leverage. It's it's saying, hey, I can trust Richard Sherman on one side a little bit more than I can trust whoever the number two is on the other side. It's this combination of all these different things. Uh, plus, Thomas isn't just a free safety. You know, he does play that role the majority of the time. But when he plays in the box and when he plays that lurk role, man, there's some he's got some special skills there. We saw that against uh, Deshaun Watson when he baited him into a pick six in more of a lurk type of role. So uh, he could do a whole lot of uh, different things with his range and his instincts and his ability to fly around the field. Well, not just that, but his range and his ability to get sideline to sideline means that he can line up in a different spot to other, other free safeties. Yeah. So the comparison was always a few years ago, Jarius Bird in Buffalo. Um, you know, he had some of that deep free safety uh, ball hawking kind of skills and had a huge number of picks and impact plays for the Bills. But if you looked on All-22 film where they would start from, where Earl Thomas versus Jarius Bird would start from, Bird was five yards, if not more, further back from the line of scrimmage at the snap because that's how he would cheat that range. So he would start off deeper, which enabled, gave him more time to make sideline to sideline on those deeper passes. But what that does is it obviously takes you away from the line of scrimmage and means you can't impact anything underneath you. Thomas is so fast and has such good range that he can line up closer to the line of scrimmage and still impact those plays in front of him and come up quickly against the run and still make those sideline to sideline plays that Bird was able to because he's just faster and has better range. Um, and the other thing it does is it means you can screw around with landmarks a little bit more. So, you know, a lot of quarterback reads are based on the safety's landmarks and where those guys are dropping to immediately after the snap. Thomas is able to cheat a little bit with that and, and either adjust his landmarks, move to a different place, um, and, and disguise things a little bit more because he can still make it to a different part. So 
he can start to look like uh, a quarter safety despite not actually playing there because he'll be able to get to the other side of the field um, and fulfill the role that he would he was supposed to have as a, a single high free safety. So it's, it's a lot of things full, uh, put together that Thomas allows that defense to do. Yeah, I, no, I agree, man. I think that's uh, a lot of good stuff there. And uh, yeah, good breakdown and a good question from uh, Mr. Kevin Ringrose, fellow PFF analyst. And uh, listener of the pod, apparently, which yeah. is great. Quick reminder that this episode is brought to you by PredictionMachine.com. Prediction Machine, a new generation in sports analytics where they play the game 50,000 times before they're actually played. Make better picks with proven data-driven analysis. Subscribe at PredictionMachine.com today and earn a $5 credit that can be used towards the purchase of any package. All right, so we have, what, two questions here on the Pro Bowl to get yeah, well, into? Yeah, now we've hit the Pro Bowl. Uh, section of today's podcast so the, i tried to avoid it I the, don't, pro, I don't the pro like bowls it. are great sort of um uh, pro bowl rosters were announced last night which obviously leads to a good portion of my night and day today just being frustrated at the idiocy of the pro bowl system and the players that get selected so we've got a couple of questions that want to kind of tackle this the first is looking for a an all non-Pro Bowl team, so almost an entire team of snubs, um, a, a team of full snub players. And then the other one is talking about the era of Mike Tolbert's automatic Pro Bowl ba- uh, selection being <laughs> over um, because Mike yeah. Tolbert was obviously always used as a running back more than a fullback, so he would always have the best stats for fullbacks. And that's what gets you voted to the Pro Bowl is is box score statistics by and large. Do, well, do we want to rant about the way they do positions first? Yes. Or do we want to... Okay. Well, that's, so now we get on to our annual fix the Pro Bowl system. So the first it's not, one... But look, real quick though, it's, it's not just the Pro Bowl. All Pro is even more broken. Not it, even it's, more. It's, 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 it's still broken, but in a different way. They've at least tried to come back to the, to, to the pack a little bit with their flex defense, flex offense and defense guy. If I have... But if I hear one more fan come back to me and say that Khalil Mack made all Pro at two different positions... Because yes. the NFL just confused the hell out of them. That is where you know, it's broken. That is where it's. I mean, that's not even. That's not even broken. That's like, you're the NFL. You know your game, and you just invented a whole different way to interpret your game. Well, it so just doesn't make any sense. The All Pro thing is, I think, broken by and large because of their voting system, where I mean, they allow people to basically choose themselves. That's an issue. The idea that they 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 all they essentially auto populate the second team All Pro based on the crap that was left over from the end of the first team all pro. So because right, you just vote for one. Yes. That's it, right? You vote one time and so if if forty nine people vote for one guy for all pro and one person votes for somebody else, that person by default becomes second team all pro at that position. Based off one guy's vote, who by definition is some kind of moron because he didn't go with the other forty nine people. <laughs> right. Um and yet he is essentially choosing second team. So the all pro has its own problems. But Pro Bowl in particular needs to stop getting tied in knots with this player designation stuff in the front seven. So one of the things PFF did years ago, because it was the only thing that made any sense, is stop trying to confuse yourself between categorizing outside linebackers and defensive ends and defensive tackles in 4-3 versus 3-4 versus hybrid systems. Let's just look at what we're talking about here, which is edge rushers, edge defenders, um, right. defensive interior players, whether they're 4-3 tackles or 3-4 ends, players that play inside, um, and stand-up linebackers. Let's categorize all those guys together. 4-3 outside linebackers, 3-4 inside linebackers. They're more or less, they're far closer together than uh, two types of outside linebackers when you're talking about an edge defender and a 4-3 stand-up outside linebacker. So those should be your three designations. Interior, uh, edge defender and stand-up linebacker. Take however, however many of those guys not, you need and roll with it. When they're not your designations, you have things like, hey, Vaughn Miller, who's an outside linebacker by name to the Broncos, but he's really just an edge rusher, Yeah, uh, gets lumped with a guy like, I know it's a different conference, but like a Levante David, the outside linebacker for the Tampa Bay Bucks, And you're comparing guys who do completely different things and they're essentially up for the same All-Pro awards or the same Pro Bowl or whatever it is. Yeah, well, that's exactly your problem. So Levante David, a 4-3 outside linebacker, having probably the season of his career, 
get snubbed for a bunch of guys that played pretty well as edge rushers because they those guys have sacks, and that's what people vote on. So Chandler Jones made the Pro Bowl team. Ryan Kerrigan made the Pro Bowl team. Um, whereas clearly it should have been Levante David if you're looking for an outside linebacker. But that's a problem with the designation system as much as anything else. We just need to fix that. Okay, so that's – I'm completely with you, absolutely. I mean this – it's 2017. Ch- changes it uh, changes everywhere. This this just needs to happen. This yeah. needs to this needs to end. Now right here. we probably need to cover the voting system itself, um, because Matthew Slater has gone to is is it now his seventh Pro Bowl? Um, Spe- special teams ace for New England. Yes, because Matthew Slater is basically the only special teams player anybody can name, so he gets voted because of that. The other problem with this is, I don't know who does this. I think it's teams choose which of their players gets designated for this stuff. So Matthew Slater is the Patriots' designated special teamer. Therefore, he's the one you choose. But Matthew Slater was injured for half the year and clearly wasn't even the Patriots' best special teamer in 2017, let alone the best special teamer in his conference. I mean, whatever you think about his career overall, he has no business at the Pro Bowl this year, and he is because the voting system is broken. Right. And just so our listeners do know, we we go very in depth when it comes to special teams. I mean, we t- we take their we do player participation where they line up. We grade it. We uh, it's part of our uh, our all 22 process. We have an entire team dedicated to grading special teams. And uh, that's why we could speak authoritatively on 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 special team stuff. Yeah. And, and people act as if the fan vote is the biggest problem in all of this. But I don't think people appreciate how the NFL players and coaches vote on this stuff, which varies team to team. There's no kind of set rule in this. But honestly, having talked to some players, in some cases, I think it may be a more suspect vote than the fan vote. Um, I talked to one guy who was telling me that their team votes as a unit. Um, so one block of votes goes to whatever, and they vote on the unit that they will play in that given year. So offensive linemen will vote on defensive linemen for um, you know, the best players in that season. But those guys just simply do not watch an awful lot of film, if any. Of no, you pl- see 12 teams per year. Exactly, of players that are not going to play them that year. So if you're asking uh, an offensive lineman, how did a guy in a different conference that we didn't play this year, how does he stack up against the rest of the league? They have no clue. But they vote as a block, um, which means automatically they are going for the guys with the biggest names and the biggest reputations that probably have still played well this year. Um, and a lot of times they haven't. Yeah, I, I think that's... that's a bit, look, the, the, the NFL's 101. When any, anytime players are involved anyway, two things, right? It's It's what you said about they're going to do it together. They're going to talk about it. You're only seeing what you're seeing. But also, every single player, not not every single player that becomes an analyst after the fact is necessarily the best at actually seeing what who's good, who's not. And But also, you need to be you know, watching. Putting context to it, right? You, ac- you actually need to be looking for it, you know? Just because well, you played and did it, just right. because you played and did it doesn't mean you're actually paying attention to what's going on now. Now, I have no well, way. you never I have strapped no idea. it up, Sam. You don't know. You don't, you've never strapped it up, you know? I want to. I really want to get as upset as uh, as Kyle did with his Princeton career. Um, I don't think I can find it in me to be quite as haughty about my second team all IAFL status. Kyle Brandt, our friends over at Good Morning Football, he went uh, what head to head with D'Angelo Williams. D'Angelo was calling him out, saying yeah. he never played. And Kyle's like, "No, man, I played at Princeton. And I'm I proud played of it. at Princeton." Pete Traeger's like, "Yeah, you're right. I never played. I'm yeah. okay though. I'm I'm on Good Morning Football every morning." What are you doing? Oh, wait, you're in the NFL. It's okay. It's all right. Yeah. But it was uh, a fun little back. I just think, so, you know, I got into it on Twitter last night a little bit with, damn, what's that guy's surname? Matt Chad. How do you pronounce that man's surname, Steve? Chatham? Chatham? Oh, Matt, Ch- Matt Chatham. Chatham? Chatham. There you go. Chatham. Sorry, just the didn't know that. Never heard it or said pronounce. out loud. Chatham. Matt Chatham, um, who was a former special teamer for the New England Patriots. And consequently thinks that Matthew Slater is the greatest special team person to exist in all of humanity ever. Um, I don't know that he has a good handle on how people have been playing in special teams. And honestly, I don't either if it wasn't for the fact that we have people watching this play in, play in, play out. Because more than any other position, special teams is the kind of thing where it's a highlight real deal. If you see a guy make a spectacular special teams tackle in a game, 
he could do nothing else for the rest of the game. And you'll probably remember him as a good special teamer out of that game. Um, but we have guys that literally go through this play by play using a system that NFL coaches have had input into. And to give you an indication of some of the stuff they're coming up with, um, obviously special team tackles, we take our own numbers down there, both made and missed. We take into account how, how many phases of special teams you play in. Do you just play on kickoff coverage? Are you only a gunner? Or are you all over the field? Are you Every time they run a special teams play, are you out there? Um, Michael Thomas, a, a safety uh, by ostensibly for the Miami Dolphins, is our pick for the best special teams player in the AFC. We track stuff like he has a 27% win, percent, 27 win rate as a vice. And those are the guys that try and block gunners on, on the punt team, which ranks fifth in the league. So, you know, we're tracking this stuff in absolute minute detail versus just looking at, you know, this guy made a few special teams tackles and, and everyone thinks he's pretty good. But honestly, we can't tell you, uh, based against his peers, how that ranks. Yeah, man. I, look, I, I, I've been, I, I don't do much. I don't do any of the special teams work other than what I see on my first run. But I, I've been so impressed with the the level of detail that our guys uh, bring to the table. And I feel I feel good. I feel yeah, stand behind our our special teams pick. So that was one of our snubs. You You wrote it up this week. Uh, 12 biggest snubs of the Pro Bowl rosters. Michael Thomas of the Dolphins as a special teamer was one of them. Who else uh, really stood out to you, Sam, as a, as a big snub when it came to Pro Bowl time? I think the biggest has to be Harrison Smith, who was the best safety in the NFL this season. I mean, the entire NFC, for some reason, managed to screw up all of their safeties. I would replace all three guys that went in the NFC's team, which is... Uh, this is a weird one. Like Smith's a name now. Usually when it comes to a, a position like safety that... Uh, unless you have like eight interceptions, it's going to be name recognition. He's a name now. It is kind of weird that he's not one of the yeah, guys. Yeah, so Malcolm Jenkins, Landon Collins, and Earl Thomas went for the NFC, and I think all three of those players should be replaced by more deserving options. The thing about Harrison Smith is that he could legitimately... <laughs> so this, the, the Pro Bowl also has this weird designation of free safety and strong safety, where they only send one free safety but two strong safeties for reasons best known to themselves. But Harrison Smith could legitimately fit either role based on how they deploy him in the Minnesota defense. He plays plenty of both free and strong safety. So he would fit either one of those roles. Has been absolutely sensational this year. That If you put him at free safety, that leaves you a space at strong safety to put in Adrian Amos at, with the Chicago Bears, who I think has had a fantastic season. The one that really confused me at safety, though, was no um, Kevin Bayard. Because if there's one thing you can trust the Pro Bowl to typically do, it's put in the guys that have fancy box score numbers. Interceptions, man. And Kevin Byard led the league in interceptions for most of the voting period. So how he isn't in there is beyond me. Yeah, Byard's had a really good year. He was the one guy, we keep coming back to this, 2016 draft class. Didn't, uh, for a few years, there really weren't a whole lot of good uh, free safety type of prospects coming out of college. Byard was a guy that stood out to us that entire year from a grading standpoint. He had a fantastic game against Alabama, which another, you know, anytime you play well against Alabama, that puts you on the map. And like you said, he had a three interception game and he's finding the football all season and essentially, you know, becoming, he's becoming kind of like the high end projection for what we had for him, that he could be this, yeah. you know, really, really good, pure free safety. It maybe even exceeding our expectations. And we were higher on him than, than the NFL and, and then you know other than other people around the league. So it's just really uh, interesting that he actually had a season that matched with the gaudy interception statistics. He's played every right. well, every bit as well as those numbers suggest. And usually guys make it just based on those numbers alone, and he hasn't for some reason. How about in the trenches? We've got uh, center Jason Kelsey up there who just having a fantastic year in the run game and just not just not losing a ton of blocks in the run game. He looks like a, my favorite thing is watching him pull. I know some of our guys have been posting some videos online of him blocking recently to kind of get some of his hype up. He really looks like a linebacker when he's on the move as a as a pulling center in their outside zone scheme and uh, the number one run block win percentage among all centers this year in the top run block grade this year. Yeah, his run block grade is 99.7, and this scale only goes to 99.9. .9. So that gives you some indication of how well Jason Kelsey is playing. I, he's a little bit unfortunate in that the next two best centers in the league are also in the NFC. In fact, the, the next three are in the NFC. So 
it is a snub, I think, in that he clearly deserves a spot. But given the two guys that went, or Alex Mack and Travis Frederick, they're at least the next two names that should have gone. So he did get beat out by two guys, at least one of which I think he should have left over. But I can't, ex- I can't really claim that the two guys that are going aren't deserving because they both have had fantastic years too. Anybody else that stood out on the list? There's, uh, I definitely want to talk Tredavious White, cornerback from B- Buffalo Bills. Who'd you have him potentially replacing? Yeah, I think the the obvious miss or the obvious corner that could go from the AFC there is Aqib Talib, who hasn't had nearly the same season. He started off this year exactly as he was a season ago, playing really well. But I think he's fallen off um, with the rest of that Denver team, that Denver defense. And Aqib Talib's coverage numbers are just nothing like they were a season ago. He was absolutely shut down last year. Um, allowed a passer rating of something crazy like 30 or 40 when he was targeted. This year, that's jumped up to 89, um, which is basically average. That's about what a quarterback throws in a given passing play. His completion percentage allowed is 10 points worse off than uh, Tredavious White's is. Um, So I think he would be the obvious guy to drop out. The other guy, the one other guy I think that deserves a mention is Melvin Ingram, who has had a fantastic season as a pass rusher again, Um, an edge defender and has been edged out for a couple of guys that are clearly there because they are more hyped names. So Terrell Suggs and Jadevian Clowney, Ingram has been comfortably better than either of those guys and is still not getting the nod. Yeah, we've talked about how Ingram and Joey Bosa are the the best tandem as far as... Uh, rushing off the edge. I almost I almost wanted to make that hot take before uh, earlier in the year that they would become the best tandem, but I was afraid to uh overtake Von Miller and anyone in Denver, <laughs> but they have. I mean, that was that's the way they've played. It's been Ingram and Bosa that have uh really helped revamp that entire Chargers defense. So, um it happens every year, man. It's almost like uh PFF office on you know, Pro Bowl day, it's just like a bunch of people. It's just a bunch of us shaking our heads like, come on, we're here. We're, we're here. You guys can use our stuff. You can use our grades. We can help guide this whole thing. We've been watching every player. Dude, Jimmy Some Graham of these guys made the Pro are Bowl. just inexcusable. Yeah, Jimmy Graham made the Pro Bowl. I mean, okay, so look, explain why you wouldn't put Jimmy Graham there. Because to, to the fantasy fan, for sure, and to just – even if you're just watching Red Zone every week or you're, you're a good fan or – there's this perception that he's had an exceptional season. And I do think that he deserves credit for the way Seattle's used him in the red zone and the way he's become a touchdown machine. It's kind of like about time, you know, that Wilson and Graham connected, but why are those touchdowns overrated in Graham's case for the pro bowl? I don't think even Seattle fans think he's had that good a season. He just happens to have been in the end zone for a a bunch of passing plays that um, Russell Wilson is connected with him on. He's also thrown four interceptions in the way in when aiming at Jimmy Graham. Uh, Graham has seven dropped passes. He hasn't actually been that good. Even if you look at his overall numbers, those aren't fantastic. It's just he happens to have a bunch of touchdowns out there. I, I really don't think that anybody sensibly believes Jimmy Graham has had this fantastic Pro Bowl season, especially not when you look at some other um, very deserving NFC candidates as well, like a guy like... Um, uh, Rudolph has had a much better season, I think, Kyle Rudolph for the Minnesota Vikings, and there's only one touchdown behind um, Jimmy Graham. And I just, I don't get the Jimmy Graham thing. Jimmy Graham, yards per route, 1.12. That ranks 31st among all NFL tight ends. And yards per route, generally, again, I think it's our best receiving stat. Not great, but just stat of pure production. And it's almost always the best the best player sitting at top, of course, number one is Rob Gronkowski. Number two, Travis Kelsey. I mean, that kind of tells the story. Graham coming in at 31st in that number. So I do I do think that would be the the argument against. Touchdowns are valuable, of course. They're important. He's been a good red zone threat. But all these other tight ends are doing uh, better work at other points of the field, too, which, again, you need to make those plays to get in to the red zone. So that's why sometimes touchdowns can be overrated. I, I hate that I always have to come back to touchdowns are overrated, but Sometimes they are, Sam. Just the way it is. Yep. They All are. right. Is that is that it for your Pro Bowl rants? Do you have anything else? Yeah, we're you good. I think that, that was a little tame one. We've fixed the Pro Bowl and we've added some players that should have been there in the first place. Please go check out Sam's 12 biggest snubs of the Pro Bowl. It's on ProFootballFocus.com. And while you're over there, be sure to sign up for Edge or Elite. If you have not already, you can use the promo code PFF10. 
you get $10 off either product and also $10 off our PFF Elite monthly product. I promise you if, you, if you're not signed up right now, there are some great things coming in January and February. Off-season greatness, quarterbacks, free agents, and draft guide all around the corner. And the best part about these new products is you get everything. It's just one big package of PFF. Two different packages. You sign up and you just get a bunch of stuff. It's what it's all about. So go check it out at profootballfocus.com. And Sam, we'll be back for a little week 16 preview. Hopefully we'll grab Mike Renner this time, see if he's actually going to work this uh, this week and preview with us. But tune in for that. Hit the subscribe button and we'll talk to you guys next time.